So this is going to be an in-depth study on Matthew 24. There are many pastors, and when Satan comes, Satan will come personating Christ. And he's in the point of view of, if you read Matthew 24 in order, it becomes after probation closes. And he had that whole study. There are other pastors who have the, the philosophy of probation is definitely still open. Uh, you know, that, that's the whole reason why we need to be careful. But we're not here to, uh, to know what these pastors are saying one way or another. We're here to study the Bible. And we will be reading from the Bible. We will be reading from the Spirit of Prophecy. And we could make our own conclusion between the two to see if probation is closed when Satan comes to personate Christ. And that's the major part of the, the study here. Uh, there are other aspects of it, uh, but that's what we're going to be learning. Now, before we start, let's have a word of prayer, and the Lord can consec consecrate this hour. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for the beautiful Sabbath. We want to thank you for the service. We want to thank you for the potluck, for those who stood, and for everything you've done for us, Lord, so far in this beautiful Sabbath, to have us spend more time with you. But Lord, we're here to open up your word, to understand your word of this crucial time of what will happen towards the end. Lord, give us wisdom so we could see what you are trying to teach us, Lord. Uh, for those who are still on their way, be with them, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so is the counterfeit appearing of Satan as Christ on the test? Meaning, have you ever, you know, in school, we're studying for something, uh, and the teacher says, pay attention, this will be on the test. Is this something the Bible's trying to tell us? Pay attention, this will be on the test. Let's read Revelation 22, 11. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Now this is speaking of the close of probation. And from this point on, nothing can happen to change anyone's mind. Everyone's mind at this point is made up. You're either for Christ or you're against Christ. And a question we need to ask is does Satan save his greatest act of deception for after the test or after the probation is over? When it is too late to deceive anyone else? Or is his greatest act of deception part of the final test or before the close of probation? Now think about all the sermons you might have heard. Have you ever heard a sermon on how to protect yourself during the last plagues? I would probably bet to venture you probably haven't. We don't hear sermons on how to protect ourselves during the last plagues because God keeps his people from the light. We will see the last plagues, but we won't, you know, we won't be affected. At it. The plagues won't fall on us. His church is safe, and we won't have to worry about it. Once you are sealed, you are protected. Now, if Satan appears after the close of probation, there would be nothing for us to worry about. But if Satan impersonates Christ before the close of probation, then we have a lot to study. These are the five parts of this study that I want to go through. Where the first part, we're going to talk about the two generations. You'll find out more about it. Uh, the second is lessons from the first, first last generation. Uh, Ellen White and Luke 21. Uh, Luke 21 is a parallel of Matthew 24. Fourth one, is Matthew 24 in chronological order, or is it repeat and enlarge? Now, a lot of pastors believe Matthew 24 is in chronological order. Many pastors believe it's a repeat and enlarge. So we will, we will make that determination. And the fifth is the three sectional times of trouble. So the first one, section one, the two generations. Matthew 24, verse one and two. 
Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now in these verses, Jesus is telling his disciples that Jerusalem will be destroyed. Verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? Now notice, the disciples ask two questions. The first question is, when will these things be, meaning the destruction of Jerusalem? And the second is, what shall be the sign of, the, of your coming at the end of the world? We could jump down to verse 32 to 34. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. You also, when you see all thing, all these things, know that it is near at the door. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Now, what does this mean? When you see the word all, all these things and this generation will not pass away till all these things take place. So in other words, every single sign will be fulfilled in that generation. Jesus is pointing out two final generations. The first, last generation, is pointing to the destruction of Jerusalem. And the last generation is pointing to the destruction of the world. The way we typically read Matthew 24 is we spread this prophecy over 2,000 years from the time of Jesus to the end of time. And uh, which we can do, because this is a dual prophecy. We could do it this way, and Ellen White does speak of it this way, but she also speaks of another way. But then Jesus could not have said, all these things will happen in that generation. We then have to say, then that these things will happen to the last generation. Now remember, Jesus answers two separate questions here. For different people, and it mingles it into one answer. This generation that sees all these things simultaneously, with that generation, shall not pass until all is accomplished. Jesus is describing to what will happen to Jerusalem. Is also, he is also describing to what will happen at the end of time. We can see that Jesus using Jerusalem as a type to what will happen at the end of time. Christ's object lessons. The tears which Christ shed upon Olivet as he stood overlooking the chosen city were not for Jerusalem alone. In the fate of Jerusalem, he beheld the destruction of the world. The final generation of Jerusalem is a type of the final generation of the world. When it comes to reading Matthew 20, 24, primarily we should not read it as it began in the days of Jesus and then go all the way down to the end of time. Matthew 24, 15 It'll, it'll make sense as I keep going. Matthew 24, 15 through 22. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken, by, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of the house. 
And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight might not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, not ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. From the destruction of Jerusalem, Christ passed on rapidly to the greater event. The last link in the chain this is from Desire of Ages, I'm sorry. Uh, the last link in the chain of the earth's history. The coming of the Son of God in majesty and glory. Between these two events, there lay open to Christ's view long centuries of darkness. Centuries for his church marked with blood and tears and agony. Upon these scenes, his disciples could not then endure to look. And Jesus passed them by with a brief mention. Then shall be a great tri tribulation. He says, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. For more than a thousand years, such persecution as, uh, as the world had never before known was to come upon Christ's followers. Millions upon millions of his followers, faithful witnesses, were to be slain had not God's hand been stretched out to preserve his people. All would have been perished, but for the elect's sake, he said, those days shall be shortened. What Ellen White is telling us is that verses 1 through 20 in the destruction of Jerusalem uh, is the destruction of Jerusalem. Then she lets us know that in verse 2, uh, uh, that I'm sorry, that in two verses, verses 21 and 22, it covers the dark ages. Then Jesus didn't want to get into too much detail with his disciples on the dark ages because he knew it was too much for them to bear at that moment. So he just breezes on by. Desire of Ages, page 631. Now in unmistakable language, our Lord speaks of his second coming and he gives warning of dangers to precede his advent to the world. If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they, say, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even into the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 23 to 25. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive. If possible, even the very elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So verse 23 and onward, we are now, now talking about the end of time. Matthew 24, 1 through 22. Now this is one way. Um, and I'll call this the version A. Version A of Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 1 through 22. Um, Jerusalem's final generation. And Matthew 24, 23 to 31 is Earth's final generation. But there are two versions of Matthew 24. The first one, A, Jerusalem and the end of the world. In the B version, 
it's the end of the world. We're going to concentrate on the B version. Jesus made plain statements on, on the conditions in the world in the last days. He said, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in the diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. On one level, uh, Matthew 24 is dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem, and it's also dealing with the end of the world. But on another level, the entire chapter of Matthew 24 is describing what happens in the final generation. Jesus is mingling his answers to address different, uh, uh, to address different things. Everyone all right so far? Um, section two, the first last generation. We're talking about Jerusalem, the last generation of people in Jerusalem, that type of people. <clears throat> what was the very first sign that Jesus said that would be the sign of the destruction of Jerusalem? What was the sign that would be the final generation, would be that, that final generation that would see the destruction of the temple? Remember, the disciples just asked, what well, will be the sign that we know that Jerusalem will be destroyed? What was the first thing that comes out of the mouth of Jesus as he answers this question? We see that in Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Now why is the first thing that Jesus says, beware of false Christ? Was there a false Christ in those days of Jesus? Matthew 27, verse 16. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Most Bibles will have a footnote in front of that name Barabbas. And if you look at that footnote, you will, know, you will find that Barabbas' name is actually Jesus Barabbas. This man, this man's name is actually Jesus. Ba means the son of, and Abbas means the father. So this man, Barabbas, is actually called Jesus, the son of the father. The crowd rejected Jesus, and in rejecting Jesus, they sealed their faith. Remember, probation was still open for the Jewish nation for another three and a half years, but in accepting Barabbas, they accepted a false Christ. Manuscript releases, uh, 112, paragraph 33. He, who would pilot, his, uh, his soul was in terrible conflict. He would present the true and the innocent Christ side by side with a notable Barabbas. And he flattered himself that the contrast between the innocence and the guilt would be so convincing that Jesus of Nazareth would be their choice. Barabbas had pretended to be Christ and had done great wickedness. Under satanic delusion, he claimed that whatever he could obtain by theft and robbery and murder was his own. A most striking contrast was presented between the two Barabbas, between the two. Barabbas was a notorious character having done wonderful things through satanic agencies. He claimed to have religious power, a right to establish a different order of things. He claimed to be Christ, and his work was to set the world right. The false Christ was claiming what Satan claimed in heaven, a right to all things. Now remember, Jesus' last name was not Christ. Christ is, um, is a Greek word, we, you know, the Hebrews say Messiah. They are the anointed one. So 
And at that time, there were many Christs who said, I am the Messiah. And Barabbas was one of them who was saying, I am the Messiah, I am the Christ. Desire of Ages. Oops. Page 739. The people of Israel had made their choice. Pointing to Jesus, they had said, not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas, the robber and murderer, was the representative of Satan. Christ was the representative of God. Christ had been rejected. Barabbas had been chosen. Barabbas, they were to have. In making this choice, they accepted him, uh, him who from the beginning was a liar and a murderer. Satan was their leader. As a nation, they would act out, um, act out his dictation. His works, they would do. His rule, they must endure. Terribly was it realized in the destruction of Jerusalem. So according to what we just read, what, what one act brought about the destruction of Jerusalem? was accepting the son of the father, Barabbas, when they chose the false Christ over the true Christ, the son of the father. The destruction of Jerusalem was all about choosing the wrong son of the father. They rejected Christ and chose an imposter in his place. This was the very first sign that Jesus gave. This generation the generation that sees the false Christ is going to be that generation that will see the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and Bible prophecy in, in, in the Bible, what is one generation? How many years is in one generation? 40 years. So within 40 years from when they chose Barabbas, did the destruction of Jerusalem happen? It was, it was before 40 years. 39 years... Uh, and they would see that Jerusalem was destroyed. If the destruction of Jerusalem of the first generation is a type of what will happen to the final generation, the very first sign in Jesus' time was Barabbas as the false Christ. And in the final generation, it will be Satan impersonating Jesus. Matthew 24, 23. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. Does Jesus give the very first sign to watch out for, uh, for in the last generation, as he did in, in the first generation who saw the destruction of Jerusalem? The word then, here, which is underlined, being used in verse 23, deals with the second coming of Christ. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if, you, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner room. Do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For whoever the, so wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. So the very first sign Jesus gives for the destruction of Jerusalem was beware of false Christs. The very first sign that Jesus gives for the destruction of the world is beware of false Christs. If both applications, in both applications, the first sign is the very first thing, beware of false Christs. And don't forget, Jesus said that the generation who sees the first sign will by no means pass away till all these things take place. The generation that sees the overmastering delusion of Satan in appearing as Christ is the final generation. When Jesus was on earth, Satan led the people to reject the Son of God and those 
and, and to choose Barabbas, who in character represented Satan, the God of this world. The Lord Jesus Christ came to dispute the, un, the usurpation of Satan in the kingdom of this world. Conflict is not ended, and as we draw near the close of time, the battle waxes more intense. As the second appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ draws near, satanic agencies are moved from beneath. Review and Herald. Satan will not only appear as a human being, but he will personate Jesus Christ. And the world who has rejected the truth will receive him as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He will exercise his power and work upon the human imagination. So deceptive will be his working that men will do as they did in the days of Christ. And when they ask, whom shall I release unto you? Christ of Barabbas, the almost universal cry will be, excuse me, Barabbas, Barabbas. And when the question is asked, what will ye then, what will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? The cry again will be, crucify him. Christ will be represented in the person as of these, of those who accept the truth and who identify their interests with that of their Lord. The world will be enlarged at them, enraged, I'm sorry, the world will be enraged at them in the same way that they were enraged at Christ. And the disciples, and the disciples of Christ will know that they are to be treated no better than was their Lord. But Christ will surely identify his interests with that of those who accept him as their personal savior. Every insult, every reproach, every false accusation made against them by those who have turned their ears away from the truth and are turned into the fables will be charged upon the guilty ones as done to Christ in the person of his saints. As the crowning act in this great drama, drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come in different parts of the earth. Satan will manifest himself among men as the majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in Revelation. Revelation 1, 13 through 15. This is the strong, over, almost overmastering delusion. But the people of God will not be misled. The teachings of the false Christ are not in accordance with the scripture. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast and his image. The very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled wrath shall be poured out. Great Controversy, page 624. So now we're going to continue now. Uh, this is section three. Uh, section three out of five. This one is entitled Ellen White and Luke 21, which is a parallel of Matthew 24. Now we could read in Luke 21, seven and eight. So they asked him saying, teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, take heed that you not be deceived for many will come in my name saying, I am he and the time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. So again, do you see the repetition from Jesus? He says, the first sign that you, we need to be looking out for is to watch out for false Christ. That's the very first sign. The Great Controversy, page 623. The glory that, sounds, that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come, Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them. As Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. Now she's talking about Satan as Christ. This isn't the real Christ who's saying, you know, when the people are shouting, Christ has come, Christ has come. 
This is Satan himself personating Christ. And Christ, and this Christ ble uh, uh, will bless his people as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people. You, uh, you understand that? He is healing the diseases of the people. And then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with the light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. So I want everyone to understand when Satan comes, personating Christ, he will be healing people. He will have all these miracles going on. If Satan has to command all to hollow the day that he has blessed, we're all hollowing that day before. If Satan comes, or when Satan comes, and he says, bless this day, does that mean all was, was already worshiping on that day? No, not yet. He, not everyone. Because he's commanding for all to worship. Another phrase for this command would be the mark of the beast. This is the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 and 17. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So when the mark of the beast is enforced, is probation still open? Do we understand, we talked about it last week, probation being open meaning we still have the opportunity to come to Christ, or we have the opportunity to get away from Christ. We're reading this. I know it could be scary. It's not to scare us. It's to inform us and to know that we, have, we serve a loving God. So <laughs> uh, Luke 21, uh, we'll read 9 through 11. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. So let's go the chronology of Luke 21. So far, from 7 through 11. The first sign that Jesus says is false Christ, or say impersonating the Messiah, or impersonating him. Followed by, so when we, see the, when we see the false Messiah, we could expect next, wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, famines, the Great Controversy 588. A spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day. It has greater power to deceive and ensnare. Satan him, himself is converted after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of an angel of light. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the instruction institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. I want to keep going. This one's a longer one. 
Uh, two more. Through spiritualism, Satan appears as a benefactor of the race, healing the diseases of people and professing to present a new and more exalted system of religious faith. But at the same time, he works as a destroyer. You get that? And one point, he is healing these people with disease, diseases, but behind his back, he is a destroyer. It is, it is his object to incite the nations to war against one another, for he can thus divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation to stand in the day of God. You get that? So, in one sense, he is healing everyone. And that's why we have in Luke 21, we see Satan impersonating Christ. He's creating wars, pestilences, and famines. Great Controversy, page 589.3. While appearing to the children of men as the great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring diseases and disaster up until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempest floods, cyclones, tidal waves, earth and earthquakes. So you, you see there, it says even now he is at work. Great Controversy 590, paragraph 1. And then the great deceiver. Who's that great deceiver? Satan, Satan himself. As Christ. We're still talking about Satan as Christ. Will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that have been provoked, the displeasure of heaven, will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities which will cease, will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced, and that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying the reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. As the wrath of the people shall be excited by false charges, they will pursue a course towards God's ambassadors, very similar to which apostate Israel pursued toward Elijah. So why are God's people being persecuted at the end? They're standing up the truth. Because, you know, the, they are blamed, being blamed for these calamities. And I believe this is a big one. The gospel is still going forth. If the gospel wasn't going forth, Satan would not have to worry about these rogue Christians. The, we're still preaching the three angels' message. We're still pe telling people, get out of her, my people. Babylon has fallen. Before the final visitation, this is a great controversy, 464, point, uh, paragraph 1. Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and power of God will be poured out upon his children. And that time, many will separate themselves from those churches in which love of this world has surplanted love for God and his word. Many, both of ministers and people, will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time, to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. So there you go. The Spirit of God will go out forth. This, you know, talk, you know, we're talking the latter rain time. We're still going out preaching the three angels' message, preaching this gospel. And these people coming out, will come out of Babylon. They will see what we're going through and say, there must be something right with those people. Uh, Ellen White, Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 1, page 113. I saw that God had children 
who do not see and keep the Sabbath. <laughs> they had not rejected the light on it, and at the commencement of the, of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. This enraged the church, the nominal Adventists, as they could not refute the Sabbath truth. And at the same time, God's chosen, God's chosen all saw clearly that we had the truth, and they came out and endured the persecution with us. And I saw the sword, famine, pestilence, and the great confusion in the land. You know, this is a concept I want to bring up. What happened in the past, what, what happened with the first generation in Jerusalem, is a type of what will happen to the last generation. And what took place, what specific thing took place after Barabbas was chosen over Jesus? Well, we could see the pouring out of the Spirit. The early rain. Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with, uh, with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So after Barabbas was chosen, the early rain was poured out on God's church. This empowered the church to go out and to convert thousands at a time. Even though Barabbas was chosen over Jesus, the Holy Spirit had descended upon the people of God to preach the gospel with power. And that's what's going to end up happening at the end. The Spirit of God, the latter rain will come out to, to the people after people choose Satan as their Messiah, thinking it's Christ, the latter rain still will be, will be poured out. Call Porter Ministry, page 151, paragraph 4. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. Great Controversy 612. The message will be carried not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. The arguments have been presented. The seed had been sown. And now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by the missionary workers have exerted their influence. Yet many whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth from, or from yielding obedience. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness. A large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. See, this is, this is the good news. This is the good side. People coming out of Babylon. So I think we kind of answered these questions, that the main question of this study. Probation is still open when Satan comes to personate Christ. Probation is still open. Satan is performing miracles, even calling fire to come down from the sky. Satan's agents are doing miracles along with God's people and a loud cry is going forward. So we need to understand that. Satan has his angels also, and they are performing these miracles too. He has his apostles, let's say. Review and, review and Herald, uh, August 18, 1885. As the truth goes forth, Satan intensifies his zeal to defeat its progress by presenting pleasing delusions. As we urge the truth, he urges his errors. He will stir up his agents in view of the coming of the Lord to go out and cry, Lo, here is Christ, and lo, there is Christ. So as, as Satan appears as Christ, when people 
uh, say, Lo, here is Christ. And as this is happening, we are still going forth with truth, meaning probation is still open. And if probation was closed, we would not be going forth with this message because it wouldn't matter. But here's the question here. What is the fire that Satan brings from heaven in the sight of man? Ellen White answers this. General Conference Bulletin, April 6, 1903. You know that Satan will come in to deceive, if possible, the very elect. He claims to be Christ, and he is coming in, pre in pretending to be the great medical missionary. He will cause fire to come down from heaven in the sight of man to prove that he is God. Now, why is fire coming down from heaven would prove that he is God? Remember the time of Elijah? And when he's, when he's having this battle with the, the, the priest of Baal, and he says, drench, well, at first he says, let's see who, you know, which God listens to us so we could have this burnt sacrifice, you know, have, God, have your gods burn this sacrifice or the Jehovah God. So all morning, all afternoon, they're cutting themselves, they're doing this ritual, and nothing's happening. So then when it was Elijah's turn, uh, he says, drench everything seven times. And then he prays a simple prayer to God, and fire comes from heaven to prove that Jehovah God is the God. And so at this time, as the latter rain is being poured out, God's people are having their own miracles happening. They're healing people through the power of Christ. But at the same time, Satan has his agents doing the same thing. And again, it's that Moses versus Pharaoh aspect, you know, what, what, what Jesus could do, you know, Satan could do. What is the fire that Satan brings from heaven? Is it real or is it symbolic? After reviewing a little bit, you know, it could be symbolic, but I do believe we're actually going to see fire from heaven. Because in two places in the Bible, in the Old Testament, we see fire coming down from heaven. We see uh, in 1 Kings chapter 18 with, uh, with Elijah. And Elijah, uh, if you remember, he's with uh, the priest of Baal and He's telling, he's telling the priest of Baal, uh, they have the two sacrifices. Whoever, whichever God can burn these sacrifices is the true God. So all morning, all afternoon, the priests of Baal are going through these chants, cutting themselves, dancing around, praying to their gods, and nothing's happening. And then in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 37, Elijah has a simple prayer. He says, hear me, O Lord, hear me. That, the, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. They have turned their hearts back to you again. And then fire comes down from heaven and burns everything, rocks everything. That was proof to, to everyone that Jehovah God is the true God. And then we also have fire coming down from heaven in 2 Kings when Solomon is dedicating the temple. And the same thing, basically, um, in 2 Kings chapter 1, uh, Solomon asks for the presence of God to come into the temple. He has a simple prayer, and fire comes down from heaven and, and goes into the most holy place. So we have th these two examples of the meaning of fire coming down from heaven. It's proving that God is the true God. So when Satan comes as Christ, he will have fire come down from heaven to show that he is the true Jesus, which we know it's all a deception. Well, honestly, I don't know where he's going to bring fire from down from heaven. But if you look what's happening in the world right now, and there's a lot of Christians confused with what's going on in Israel, um, with, you know... Um, they want, a lot of Christians, and obviously the Jewish people, want the temple to be rebuilt because they believe that Christ is coming for that temple. 
So I believe, and this is just me, it's not Bible, it's not, yeah, I, I don't think Ellen White talks too much about this, but it, w- it wouldn't make sense for me for the Christ, the devil, to come as Christ to go into that temple and fire come down from heaven. Right. While God's people are healing and preaching the three angels' message, Satan brings fire down and he is opposing the work of the three, mess- three angels' message to go forward. Want to read from the Great Controversy? Page 464. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this work. And before the time for such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. In those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be a manifest that uh, manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exult, and God is working marvelous, marvelously for them. When the work is that of another spirit under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. When the devil comes as Christ, with the help of the Protestants of the United States, it's, you know, that because we see that with the second beast of Revelation uh, 13, it's to bring everyone together. There won't be any other religion except for Christian religion, the true Christian religion and the false Christ- Christian religion. Great Controversy, page 484. They will be brought before kings and rulers and before councils to meet the false, absurd, and lying accusations brought against them. But they must stand firm as a rock to principle. And the promise is, as, the, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Um, so the process that we see so far going on in Luke chapter 21, we will see the false Christ. From there we see calamities and nations warring against nations and the people of God gets the blame for these calamities. Let's continue in Luke 21 verses 13 through 15. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth in wisdom, which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Want to read from the Great Controversy 607. As the controversy extends into new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light, lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power. And in this work, papists and Protestants unite. Whenever that happens, you know there's a problem. When the, pay, when the church and, and state unite, it always goes against the Christians or God's people. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against the commandment keepers. They will be threatened with fines and imprisonment, and some will be offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. But their steadfast answer is, show us from the word of God our error. The the same plea that was made by Luther under similar circumstances. Those who are arraigned before the courts make a strong vindication of the truth, and some who hear them are led to take their stand to keep all the commandments of God, Thus, light will be brought before thousands who otherwise would know nothing 
of these truths. So, there's going to come a point where there is, uh, that's going, uh, laws will be going against the commandment keepers for fines and imprisonment. You know, that's what, what we understand is the mark of the beast. That's the start of the mark of the beast. And to try to influence these Sabbath keepers away, and I would suggest some will take this offer, they will, give, they will be given um, positions of influence. They will become wealthy. You know, you drop this, you know, who cares about the Sabbath? Come worship on the Sunday. We'll give you so much money. We'll give you this power. We'll give you, you know, cars and planes and who, who knows what else. But the true people of God will say, as Martin Luther said, we're in error. Let me get the exact quote. Show us from the word of God our error. And that is what we need to stand firm on. All right, let's continue. Luke 21, 16 through 19. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers. Now here it is, family members relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But no hair, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess, possess your souls. So, at this point, is probation still open? And we could see that because people are still being put to death. Correct? The death decree has to be put in place so they can stop putting God's people to death. So we see that probation is still open because we still have people dying. When probation closes, there is no more death. There's no need for God's people to die anymore. So, but God's people are still dying. So we could figure out that probation is still open. And when Satan issues his death decree, everyone still has a choice to either one, they will choose the Christ and live, the Christ, you know, Satan as Christ, or they can choose the rebels and they may die. That is the choice at this time. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones and they sat on them, and judgment was committed on them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for, beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on his foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So you see this. There are still going to be martyrs coming for the people who did not receive the mark of the beast. So the death decree, many people will say, once a death decree happens, you run away, probation is closed. I believe it's closing. I don't think it's 100% closed because we still have martyrs going. Let's continue in Luke. Luke chapter 21, 20 through 24. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be a great distress in the land and wrath upon the peop on this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So in Psalm 37, 14, we see that the wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are upright conduct. So, the abomination of desolation at this time is the same as the death decree. 
the abomination back in 70 AD or 67 AD at first, when it was when the army surrounded Jerusalem. You know, when Jesus says, when you see the army surround, or when um, we know it's time to flee. So Rome surrounded Jerusalem in 67 AD. For some reason they left, and all the Christians left Jerusalem. They came back in 70 AD, and if anyone read uh, Fox's Martyrs, Fox's uh, Book of Martyrs, book of, it's awful what they went through. Or if anyone read from um, Josephus, if anyone read his account on this, they would surround the city, not let any food or water go in for days and weeks, and people were actually killing their babies and eating them. It was awful. And then they came in and wrecked the city. They wrecked Jerusalem. They, like Jesus said, one rock will not stand upon another. So that's the abomination of desolation back in 70 AD. The abomination of desolation, what happened in the past, will happen to the future. The abomination of desolation in today's world coming up is when the death decree is out. When, when, the death, when there's a decree, when there's a law that, that says, if you, were, if you still worship on the Sabbath, you will die. Come worship on Sunday. That is the mark of the beast. Well, mark of the beast is already out. The original mark of the beast, when the mark of the beast comes out, it's no buy or sell. Now we're talking about the death decree. That this is the abomination of desolation. When church and state come together, it always goes uh, to persecute God's people. So the abomination of desolation is when God's people are surrounded and a decree to slay them is issued. And we also see this in Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should not both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. This is the death decree, which is different than the mark of the beast. And like I said, the mark of the beast when, uh, when, it first, when, when it's first enacted, it's no buy or sell. The death decree is issued when God's people constantly refuse to obey this Jesus and, the false, and this false Messiah. And it's telling the people that these calamities and pestilence is the cause of these people, these ragtag people who not bow down and worship me. I'm going to read Great Controversy, page 607. Conscientious obedience to the word of God will be treated as rebellion. Blinded by Satan, the parents will ex exercise harshness and severity toward the believing child. The master or mistress will oppress the commandment-keeping service servant. Affection will be alienated. Children will be dis disinherited and driven from home. The words of Paul will be literally fulfilled. All that will be, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12. As the defenders of truth refuse to honor the Sunday Sabbath, some of them will be thrust into prison. Some will be exiled, and some will be treated as slaves. To human wisdom, all this now seems impossible, but as the restraining spirit of God shall be withdrawn from men, and they shall be under the control of Satan, who hates the divine precepts, there will be strange developments. The heart can be very cruel when God's fear and love are removed. Isn't that true? And I like how she says, now this all seems impossible. Because growing up, I was saying the same thing. I believed, you know, the death decree is going to happen. The mark of the beast is going to happen. But I always wondered how. How here in the United States, we have this beautiful constitution. We have this constitution that says that we need a separation of church and state. How can that happen? 
you know, I think we all live through 2020. I think we all know how easily we give up rights for the, for the, to be safe among other people. How easily we will give up our right to freely choose who to worship if it means we can live together with no wars and peace and no calamities for, the, for all humanity, common good. All right, let's continue. Great Controversy, page 608. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition by uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit. They have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side, men of talent and pleasing address, who once rejoiced in the truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become, and this is what's even more devastating, more uh, vicious, they become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. But doesn't this here, a large class who have professed the faith in the third angel's message, isn't that the class where Jesus says, uh, get away from me, I never knew you? Even though, you know, what do you mean, Lord? I was, I was healing people in your name. I was doing all these things in your name. And Jesus says, get away, I never knew you. Because they might be saying the right things, but they have not been sanctified through the obedience of truth. That is the difference. Just because you're here in this church does not make you saved. Just because you have your name in the books in this church does not mean you're saved. Because there are the people who are going to be leaving and going to be the most bitter, our most bitter enemies, those empty seats are going to be taken from the people from the outside coming in. Great Controversy 615. As the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom, the religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of the Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them object, objects of universal ex execration. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state ought not to be tolerated, but it is better for them to suffer than for the whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. The same arguments many centuries ago was brought against Christ by the rulers of the people. It is expedient for us, said the, the, said the wily Caiaphas, that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not, John 11:50. This argument will appear conclusive and a decree will finally be issued against those who hollow the sa Sabbath of the fourth commandment, denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishments and giving the people liberty after a certain time to put them to death. Romanism in the old world and apostate Protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course toward those who honor all the divine precepts. Great Controversy 616. The people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress described by the prophet as the time of Jacob's trouble. Thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. All faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob, Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah 35 through 7. So do we see this timeline? 
when the time of Jacob's trouble is here, that is when probation is closed. But we don't know that. We might be seeing these plagues falling all around us, but not touching us. But we still will be confused because God has not come. Why has God forsaken me, as Jesus said? We'll be asking that same, and we will be afflicting our souls. Why is God not come to, you know, why hasn't he come yet? Is there a sin I haven't repented of yet? The book Maranatha, July 10th, she says, Ellen White says, the two armies will stand distinct and separate. And this distinction will be so marked that many who shall be convinced of truth will come on the side of God's commandment keeping people. When this grand work is to take place in the battle prior to the last closing conflict, many will be imprisoned, many will flee for their lives from cities and towns, and many will be martyrs for Christ's sake and standing in defense of the truth. They will be brought before kings and rulers and before councils to meet the false, absurd, and lying accusations brought against them. But they must stand firm as a rock to principle. And the promise is, as thy day, so shall thy strength be. You will not be tempted above what you are able to bear. Jesus bore all this and far more. So that is the promise. While we're going through, and you know, it could be scary. It could sound scary. We're out. You might not be with your loved one. You might not be with your husband, your wife, your daughter, your son at this point. You might be by yourself. It might sound scary, and it probably does. You know, it is scary to think that you are all alone. And you have to go through this, but you're not alone. You might feel alone, but God is with you. You might not feel that right away. You might not always feel that. But the promise here is you will not be tempted above what you are able to bear. If you're not able to bear it, God will not allow it for you. In chronological order, uh, it starts with the signal of the last generation. This is also how Ellen White says Satan will do it. First thing, Satan will appear personating Christ. With that... He, will, he brings calamities and wars. Then he will blame these calamities on the people of God because, number one, they're preaching the gospel, the three angels' message. The gospel message is still going out. And number two, they refuse to honor him as Christ and acknowledge Sunday as the holy day. They will be hated, persecuted, and delivered up before councils and kings. Many will betray one another, even friends and family. Then the abomination of desolation, or the death decree, happens. And at this point, God's people will flee from the cities. That is where we are in the chronological time of what we just read. It starts with, say, impersonating Christ, all the way to, we need to flee. We're not there yet. We haven't seen the false messiah yet, but this is where, where we're heading. Uh, we're going to read Luke chapter 21, 25 and, 20, through 20, 25 and 26. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now let's see what Ellen White says about this. December 16, 1848. The Lord gave me a view of the shaking of the powers of heaven. I saw that when the Lord said heaven, in giving the signs recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he meant heaven. And when he said earth, he meant the earth. The powers of heaven are the sun, moon, and stars. They rule in the heavens. The powers of the earth are those that rule on the earth. The powers of heaven will be shaken at the voice of God. Then the sun, moon, and stars will be moved out of their, place, out of their places. They will not pass away, but be shaken by the voice of God. That's Christian Experience and Teaching, page 111. 
Do we understand? This is the time. This is the second coming now. When right before the Lord comes, the sun, moon, and stars will be shaken out of its, out of its place. Testimonies to ministers and gospel workers. The sealing of the servants of God is the same that was shown to Ezekiel in vision. John also had been a witness of this most startling revelation. He saw the sea and the waves roaring and men's hearts failing them for fear. He beheld the earth moved and the mountains carried into the midst of the sea, which is literally taking place. The water thereof roaring and troubled, and the mountains shaking with the swelling thereof. He was shown plagues, pestilence, famine, and death performing their terrible mission. So this also goes to show the second coming of Christ. Is it going to be a secret? When all these things are happening, everyone will be seeing sun, moon, stars. Everything's going to be put out of place. Christian experience and teaching. Dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. Then we could look up through the open space in Orion, whence came the voice of God. The holy city will come down through that open space. I saw that the powers of earth are now being shaken and that events came in order. And I think this is pertinent. Uh, Great Controversy, page 627. When Christ ceases, ceases his intercession in the sanctuary, the unmingled wrath threatened against those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark will be poured out. So this is all at the end. In Luke... 21, 27, 28. We'll finish this passage. We'll finish Luke 21 with this. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws near. Great Controversy 636. It is at midnight that God manifests the, his power for the deliverance of his people. The sun appears, shining in its strength. Signs and wonders follow in quick succession. The wicked look with terror and amazement upon the scene, while the righteous behold with solemn joy the tokens of their deliverance. Everything in nature seems turned out of its course. The streams cease to flow. Dark, heavy clouds come up and clash against each other. In the midst of the angry heavens is one clear space of indescribable glory, whence comes the voice of God, like the sound of many waters, saying, It is done. And who can't wait for that moment? So with that, our progression of events we see in Luke 21, is Satan appears as Christ. He will heal and have fire come down from heaven to prove that he is Christ. Behind everyone's back, he brings wars, destruction, and pestilence. He blames these calamities on the people of God because they are resisting him, and they continue to preach the three angels' message. And God's people are delivered up to councils and kings. God's people are betrayed by family members. The abomination of desolation standing in the holy place or the death decree will, will take place. Then men's hearts are failing them for fear because there are signs in the sun and in, in the moon and the stars. And then the Son of God is coming in the clouds. So that is basically Matthew 21. That is done with section 3. That was Luke 21. Now, Matthew, section 4, Matthew 24. Is it in chronological order or is it repeat and enlarge? Um, I will show in the Bible. Um, I believe it's repeat and enlarge. 
uh, like how we have other prophecies, especially end time prophecies in, in Revelation and Daniel, it's always repeat and enlarge. Matthew 24, I broke it up into four categories. Section A is Matthew 24, 4 through 8. Section B, Matthew 24, 9 through 14. Section C, I know, Matthew 24, 15 through 28. And then section D, the fourth one, Matthew 24, 29 through 31. So I'm going to read these different sections. Matthew 24, 4 through 8. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Let's continue. 9 through 14. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So here's a question. Verse 14, it's speaking of the end, is it not? Yeah. The end will come. That's with the second coming of Jesus. Is there anything after the end, or is the end the end? Is the end, that's it? The end, the end of this world? So technically speaking... Verse 14 brings us to the end and the second coming of Jesus. But we still have more verses. So again, is it chronological? Now we're going backwards now. You get what I'm saying? For anyone who says that Matthew 24 is totally chronological, this won't make sense. So now Jesus expands on what he just said. Section C, 15 to 28. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of, the, out of his house. And let him who is, who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, not ever shall be. <clears throat> and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved for the elect's sake. Those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. <clears throat> and let's go back. In um, verse 15, we see the word therefore. Now, what does that mean? Let's read that again. Verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination that comes after on, the, on account to, to what we just read, to what we just read, this is going to happen. 20, Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with great sound of a trumpet, 
and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. In section A, if you wrote it down, which is Matthew 24, 4 through 8, I believe that is chronological. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. The Great Controversy, uh, page 624, as the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. Let's continue. Great Controversy, page 623. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness. I want to stop right there for a second. You, want, you read what, what Ellen White wrote? In different parts of the earth. When Christ comes, all will see. It won't be in different parts of the earth. Resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in Revelation, Revelation 1, 13, and 15, 13 through 15. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. We see Satan heals the diseases of the people. Is Satan able to heal people who are suffering from diseases um, of the plagues? No. Absolutely not. So again, this must be the time before probation is closed. Matthew chapter 24, 6 through 8. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So first sign we see, and again, I'm going to keep repeating this. The first sign we see is the false Christ. Then we have wars and rumors of wars. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 441. Satan will continue to act a double, a double part, appearing to be the dispenser of great blessings and divine truths. He will, by his lying wonders, hold the world under his control. And at the same time, he will indulge his mal malignity by causing distress and destruction and will accuse God's people as the cause of the fearful convulsions of nature and the strife and bloodshed among men, which are desolating the earth. Thus, he will excite the greater intensity the spirit of hatred and persecution against them. So Matthew 24, the chronology of the last generation who sees all things. Satan appears as Christ, deceiving many. Verse 6 through 8, he brings natural disasters and wars, and blaming them on God's people, enforcing Sunday, enforces Sunday, sacredness and commands all to hallow the, do, to hallow the day. This is the beginning of sorrows or the early time of trouble. And right, let's continue. Um, Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and betray one another and will hate. So after this time, People start betraying one another. Family is turning on one another. Church members are turning on one another. They are doing this because they are deceived by the false Christ. We know that this has to be um, the death decree because in verse 9 we read, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. It will be legal to kill you for not following what, what the false Christ is saying. Thus, there must be a decree to legally kill you. So in verse 9, we see the death decree there. So, verse 9 and 10, we see the betrayal of God's people for their own 
the death decree is issued, and they are delivered up to be afflicted and killed. Matthew 24, 11 through 14. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound and love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. While the death decree is pronounced, many false prophets shall arise. So in verse 11, we see the miracles working power being used by, first and, by the first and second beast, plus spiritualism through fallen angels, the apostles appearing to contradict the word. 12 to 14 is the patience of the saints. They, they endure to the end, and the gospel is preached to the whole world through the latter reign, and then probation close. Let's read how Mark puts it. Mark 13, 9 through 11. But watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and they will be beaten in the, in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. Then the gospel must be preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So this is what I believe for anyone who's taken the notes. Section A is in chronological order. Then continues on with section B. And section B is Matthew 29, 9 through 14. Section C, which is continues 15 to 28, is a repeat and enlarge of 9 to 14. And then section D goes back to chronological order. Now let's read why I say they're in um, uh, repeat and enlarge. On the left, we have uh, Matthew 24, 9 and 10, and on the right, we have Matthew 24, 15 through 21. Now tell me if this doesn't sound similar. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be ha hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended. Many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. And then verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is in the, on the housetop not go down to take anything out of the house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. Um, okay, so as you could see, um, section B and section C here, I believe is repeat and enlarged. The first part of section B, which is verse 9 and 10, it says, they will deliver you up to kill you and afflict you, and many will betray one another. In verse 15 through 21, it says, uh, there will be great tribulation. And we can see that section C is a repeat and enlarge of section B. The abomination of desolation is when the armies of Satan surround God's people to try to kill them just like the armies of Rome surrounded Jerusalem to destroy it. Do we understand that? The abomination of desolation in the past was when uh, the armies of Rome surrounded Jerusalem. The abomination of desolation now is when the armies of Rome will surround us as far as giving a death decree. That is the abomination of desolation. That is our key to run for the mountains. So I just want to go through these. I have section A, B, C, and D basically 
showing how they are related. In Matthew 24, 4 through 8, section A, we see that Satan appears as Christ. He commands all to keep Sunday. He is performing miracles that, um, that is deceiving the world. He brings natural disasters and blames the people of God. People of God refuse to accept him as Christ. In section B, 9 through 14, they will deliver you up to be killed. You will be hated by all nations, but the gospel will be preached in all the world. Then the end comes. Section C, and if you read the bottom, they have B and C are together. They are parallel. They are repeat and enlarged. In verse 15 through 28, the abomination of desolation is when they deliver you up to be killed. The miracles that continue to happen are trying to convince God's people that this is really Jesus. While this is happening, the death decree has been issued and some of God's people are dying, but the gospel is still being preached in all the world. Then the end comes. Section D, Michael stands up. The close of probation, plagues begin to fall, men's hearts are failing them for the fear of the things that are coming on the earth and the sign of the Son of Man. Any, everyone okay? I will right, finish with um, Great Controversy, page 636. Um, we will paragraph two and three. <clears throat> it is at midnight that God manifests his power for the deliverance of his people. The sun appears, shining in its strength. Signs and wonders follow in quick succession. The wicked look with terror and amazement upon the scene, while the righteous behold with solemn joy and solemn joy the tokens of their deliverance. Everything in nature seems turned out of its course. The streams cease to flow. Dark, heavy clouds come up and clash against each other. In the midst of the angry heavens is one clear space of indescribable glory. Whence comes the voice of God like the sound of many waters, saying, It is done. The voice shakes the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> there is a mighty earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great, verse 17 and 18. The firmament appears to open and shut. The glory from the throne of God seems flashing through. The mountains shake like a reed in the wind, and ragged rocks are scattered on every side. There is a roar as, a, as of a, a coming tempest. The sea is lashed into fury. There is heard the shriek of a hurricane like the voice of demons upon the mission of destruction. The whole earth heaves and swells like the waves of the sea. Its surface is breaking up. Its very foundations seem to be given way. Mountain chains are sinking. Inhabited islands disappear. So again, I will say, is the second coming of Christ going to be a secret thing? Not with what we're reading. Definitely won't be secret. Because people were confused last time we were here, speaking of the... The objects in the sky moving, the sun, moon, and stars um, moving out of their place. You know, a person was suggesting what we read in Matthew 24 deals with the end of time. And a person was saying uh, that that has to do with the sixth seal, which it doesn't. So I just want to point someone... Let's read Revelation chapter 6. Grab my Bible. Revelation chapter 6, uh, verse 12 and 13. This is the sixth seal as the seal is being opened. So Revelation chapter 12. I mean, I'm talking chapter 6, verse 12. Uh, Jesus is opening the sixth seal. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black. And the black as sackcloth of hair, 
and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. So we are living, and if you continue reading, we don't, we're not going to do a study on the seals, but we are living in the sixth seal. This just happened. Now we're actually waiting for uh, the mountains to move and the kings of the earth, uh, the commanders, mighty men. They ask for the mountains to fall. This is the second coming. So we're in between the sixth seal being completely plucked. And the great earthquake, this is historical fact. It has, this, uh, this ha doesn't have to deal with the end of the time right now. Great earthquake happened in 1755. The darkening of the sun happened in 1780 with the moon becoming blood in 1780 and the stars falling in 1833. Now, if we read in Matthew 24, there it is, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation, so this is after the tribulation, this is what we're talking about, the great time of tribulation, Jacob's time of trouble. And of those days, the sun will be darkened. <clears throat> now, here's the difference. In Revelation chapter 6, what did the moon do? The moon turned red as blood. Here, at the end of time, the moon will not give its light and stars will fall from heaven. That's why it's two different events. And one event, which happened already, historical event, happened, um, moon turns to blood. At the end of time, we see the moon is darkened. You know, the, I, you know a lot of people get confused because you still, you see moon, star, moon, sun, moon, and stars, and you think it's the same event, but it's not. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear, the war, hear of rum, wars, rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. In early writings, page 33, I saw that God had children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They had not rejected the light on it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. This enraged the church, the nominal Adventists, as they could not refute the Sabbath truth. And at this time, God chose all. God's chosen all saw clearly that we had the truth. And, that, and they came out and endured the persecution with us. And I saw the sword, famine, pestilence, and great confusion in the land. The wicked thoughts that we had brought the judgments down on them. They rose up and took counsel to rid, of the, to rid the earth of us, thinking that then the evil would be stayed. So imagine that. At the commencement of the time of trouble, do we understand what this time of trouble is? The Sunday law, that's part of it. That's the Sunday law at first is the buy and sell. The time of trouble happens. That's a small time. The time of trouble, the big time, is when this person, when you, you will die. That is our time of trouble. The little time of trouble is no buying or selling. We're still going out. We're still preaching the three angels' message at this time. We're just not buying. It's, that, it's become more difficult for us. Eventually, they're going to pass a law that's going to say, if you don't worship on Sunday, we will kill you. That is the big time of trouble. So at this time, believe it or not, people come out of Babylon because we're still preaching. They're coming out of the church. And um, this enraged the church in nominal Adventists. 
So the church, the nominal Adventist church, gets angry when we are not bowing the knee to Babylon. We, we say, no, the Sabbath is the truth. We will not bend the knee. Let's keep on going. Early writings, page 85. The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth and the nations will be angry, yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. So this tells me when the plagues happen, when the seven last plagues come down, probation is closed. There's no more changing minds, there's no more changing sides. When uh, the time of trouble happens, we still see that uh, there's still a little bit of time before the plague start to fall. So probation is still open at this time. I believe there's still going to be martyrs at this time. Once probation closes, there's no, need more, there's no more need for death to be a martyr. So at this time, probation is closing. It hasn't fully closed. Uh, Cole Porter Ministry, page 151. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. So this is what's happening during the early time of trouble. The devil is causing fire to come down from heaven to prove that he is Jesus. While this is happening, God's people are preaching the three angels' messages. And we have people still making decisions. Review and Herald, August 18, 1885. The third angel's message must, must go over the land and awaken the people and call their attention to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Another angel unites his voice with the third angel, and the earth is lighted with its glory. The light increases, and it shines out to all the nations of the earth. It is to go forth as a light that burneth. It will be attended with great power until its golden beams have fallen upon every tongue, every people, and every nation upon the face of the whole earth. As the truth goes forth, Satan intensifies his zeal to defeat its progress by presenting pleasing delusions. As we urge the truth, he urges his errors. He will stir up his angels in view of the coming of the Lord to go out and cry, Lo, here is Christ, and lo, there is Christ. So as we're preaching the three angels' message, he has his people, his angels, and then uh, he, as in Satan, and at this time, Satan is as Christ. He is personating Christ. And he's having his angels saying, lo, here is Christ. So Matthew 24, 9 through 14, we see Jacob's time of trouble prior to the close of probation. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Satan goes with a death decree, but God's people are still preaching. 
And again, we see in verse 15 through 27, uh, it's a repeat and enlarge of what we just read. Let's go to Prophets and Kings, page 588. Men will be required to render obedience to human edicts in violation of the divine law. Those who are true to God will be menaced, menaced, denounced, and proscribed. They will be betrayed by both, both by parents and brethren and kinfolks and friends, even unto death. Now, isn't that amazing? Your own parents will go out. Your own children will go out and take counsel against you. Christian experience and teaching. The wicked thought that we had brought the judgments upon them. And they rose up and took counsel to rid the earth of us, thinking that then the evil would be stayed. So all these disasters are going on. And these disasters are going on as the devil is personating Christ and saying, I am the Christ. He's doing these great miracles in front of people. But behind his back, he is causing calamities, pestilence, wars. All these things are going on. And he is telling the people, all these are from those ragtag type of people who are not bowing down to me and worshiping on my day. We need to kill them. We need to get rid of them. Or else these catastrophes will continue on. So they think they're doing good. They think they're doing good for, for the sake of humanity. The next study in two weeks will be the four stages of the Sunday Law. And we will see how far these, and I'm just going to pick on one because I think this is going to be a big topic for these end times, the environmentalists. Mm -hmm. We need a day off for the earth. That's what they're saying. And you read the encyclicals of the Pope, and that's what he's saying. We need Sundays off. Uh, to heal the earth. And all these people are, you know, who's saying these earthquakes are happening, these, these, you know, temperature. Today is a beautiful spring day in December. So, of course, they're going to say it's climate change. You know, this shouldn't be like this. And we need to do something or we're going to lose the earth. And anyone who, is, who, who wants to burn fuel all the time, well, it's your fault if you want to keep going uh, you know, doing your thing for seven days a week, you're the one that's going to kill this earth. So that is one, I believe, going to be a big subject for us, is the environment. Revelation 13, verse 15. <clears throat> he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So the mark of the beast and the death decree are two different decrees. I want us to realize that. When we talk about the mark of the beast the, and the death decree, the mark of the beast, um, one decree is commanding all to keep the first day of the week in place of the seventh day of the week. And the punishment is upon breaking the law is not being able to buy and sell. That is the mark of the beast in general. Now, it eventually evolves to um, the death penalty. But when we first talk about the mark of the beast, it's the no buying or selling. As Satan, as Christ, is causing calamities in the world, he will blame it all on the people of God. As it becomes more drastic, the, the decree will eventually evolve to include the punishment of death. As all this is going on, Probation is still open because this is the test that God's people are to face. Great Controversy, page 625. As the decree issued by the various rulers of the Christendom against the commandment keeping, keepers shall withdraw the protection of government and abandon them to those who desire their destruction. The people of God will flee from the cities and villages and associate together in companies dwelling in the most desolate and solitary places. 
what I just read, you know, that is the abomination of desolation when we need to flee. And this is what Ellen White says about the abomination and desolation that's going to happen. In Christian Services, Christian Service, page 161. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was a signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities, preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places along the mountains. Now, when the, when the mark of the beast happens, the no buying or selling, that is our cue to leave the cities. It's not our cue to run for the hills, run for the mountains and just be solitary. We need to leave the cities and have, you know, and hopefully we have a police prepared for us where there's no buying or selling, so there's no more going to the grocery stores. You know, you would need to plant your own food because I believe this isn't going to be a week's time where there's no buying or selling. It's going to be a period of time. So we should be preparing now. Yeah, but Michael, would that, be called the small time of trouble? that is the small time of trouble. When the mark of the beast happens, that's the small time of trouble. You know, the, this isn't the time to... You know, don't go back where Jesus says, don't go back for your coats, you know, just go. That is the, that is the, the big time of trouble. That is when um, the death decree happens. But at this point, when there's no buying or selling, you need to leave the large cities. You, we need to be country folk. This is our time to prepare. Yes, um, I believe we should all be preparing. And uh, most people here, I think, know we, my wife and I are preparing to go and live in the country and hopefully in the next year or so um, because I believe that's where our calling is. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, I was, I've been reading a lot on Ellen White about last day events, reading that book and uh, uh, country living, that's what it is, country living. Basically, she says, um, and I was reading up on it, uh, that was the time to be preparing for country living. That doesn't mean in the next 10 weeks, you're gonna move everything and live in the country. But now is the time to be preparing. That doesn't mean also, I'm gonna do it in 10 years. You know, and, and that doesn't mean that we should all, you know, God has his few still living in the city, and we also need to come back to the city and preach to those in the city. And he still has his people living in the city to help the people in the city. But I believe the majority of us need to be living, leave, or preparing to leave the city. I'm not saying in the next year, but we need to be looking more. How is the time to prepare? Prepare spiritually. We should be reading our Bible because we're not bringing our cell phone wherever we go. We're not going to have it. You're not going to have television. If you happen to have your Bible on you, great. If not, it's all going to be in your head. So we need to be preparing, reading the Bible. We need to prepare how to live in the woods or country life, what to do, how to plant. Even if you live in an apartment right now, you could get a little pot or a few pots put in your kitchen and start growing herbs. And that'll help you teach how to grow some plants just to get you prepared. Any little step right now is to help. I'm not saying we should all be farmers right now, but at least know what to do in case of emergency. Last day events, 257. The time of trouble is about to come upon the people of God. Then it is that the decree will go forth forbidding those who keep the Sabbath of the Lord to buy or sell and threatening them with punishment and even death if they do not observe the first day of the week as the Sabbath. That's also found in heavily paid places, page 344. I want to read something from Ellen White Materials, 1888 Materials, page 484. The two armies will stand distinct and separate. 
And the distinction will be so marked that many who shall be convinced of truth will come on the side of God's commandment keeping people. When this grand work is to take place in the battle, prior to the last closing conflict, many will be imprisoned. Many will flee for their lives from cities and towns, and many will be martyrs for Christ's sake in standing in defense of the truth. They will be brought before kings and rulers and brought before councils to meet the false, absurd, and lying accusations before, uh, brought against them. But they must stand firm as a rock to principle. And the promise is, as the days, so shall the strength be. You will not be tempted above what you are able to bear. Jesus bore all, this and far more. So as we see, there are still martyrs. So probation is still open. And we see this in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until, the judge, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren would be killed as they were was completed. So when the fifth seal happened, this is talking about the martyrs of the past. You know, and of course, this is symbolism. There's no souls under the, the altar in heaven crying out for the Lord, symbolism, but martyrs of the past are crying out, how long? So Jesus gives them the white robe and says, a little while longer, you're going to have more brothers and sisters, they're going to come first. So we're going to have more martyrs. Read another one from Revelation, this one's from chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of, uh, for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and not, had not received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So the people who do not get the mark of the beast on their forehead, on their hand, some of them will be martyred. So of course... This whole subject is, is probation open uh, when, G, when the devil comes as Christ? I believe we see it through Bible, through the spirit of prophecy. Yes, probation is open for a little time longer. In the spirit of prophecy, volume 4, page 423. Heretofore, those who presented the truths of the third angel, the, the third message, have often been regarded as mere alarmists. The prediction that church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God has been pronounced groundless and absurd. It has been confidently declared that this land could never become other than what it has been, the defender of religious freedom. But as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is wildly agitated, the events so long doubted and disbelieved, it seemed to be approaching. And the third message produces the effect which it could not have had before. Before 2020, you know, I always, I would always say, yes, of course, I believe what the Bible says, that the second beast is the United States and we're going to hold hands in the abyss with the, with the Catholic Church. And I believe, you know, I read from the Bible that they're going to change laws to, you know, to force people to worship on Sunday. But in my head, I would always, I believe it, but how is that going to happen? That was before 2020, before COVID happened. And how easily people would give up their rights for the better of humankind. And next time we meet, we're going to talk about the four stages of the Sunday law. And there are people in Congress already who are talking about the, uh, not to separate church and state. They actually want to combine it. And they said, that is not in our Constitution. That was a letter written by Benjamin Franklin. It has nothing to do with the Constitution. 
So there are people pushing in legislation for uh, the com combination of church and state. So before probation closes, everyone has to see the truth and everyone has to see the error. The error is believing Satan when he is personating Christ and believing that Sunday is the true day of worship. But the truth is also being proclaimed in the teaching that the three, of the teaching of the three angels' message. It is not until everyone has heard and that, every, and that every, everyone has made a decision uh, to either uh, for the true Christ or the false Christ. And I like one of, the, one of our studies we had. My aunt said, um, as long as there is one person who has not made his decision or her decision, Jesus will not close probation until everyone has made that decision. It could be that one person, but eventually everyone will make that decision. Probation is done. Michael stands up. And then probation closes, and then the plague starts to fall. Let's move to Jacob's time of trouble. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be, will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from... Uh, from one end of heaven to the other. We also see this in Mark. We don't have to go through that. And in Luke. Let's read what um, Patriarchs and Prophets says. Page 201. When Christ shall cease his work as mediator in, man, in man's behalf, then this time of trouble will begin. Then the case of every soul will have been decided, and there will be no atoning blood to cleanse from sin. When Jesus leaves his position as man's intercessor before God, the solemn announcement is made, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Then the restraining spirit of God is withdrawn from the earth. And of course, we see this in Daniel chapter 12 when Michael stands up. This is the close of probation. Great Controversy 614. When he leaves the sanctuary, darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of, the, of a holy God without an intercessor. The restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed. And Satan has entire control of the finally impenitent. Satan will then plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be, at, will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. Will Jesus be coming? Even in the Old Testament talks about this. In Psalm 68, 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as in Sinai, in the holy place. Isaiah 66, 50, 15, for behold, the Lord will come with, a fire, with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. This does not sound like a silence coming. When Jesus comes again, he will be coming like a whirlwind with chariots of fire. But Satan uses the same imagery to counterfeit the second coming. Satan will be coming with chariots. Not only will he be dealing uh, with Satan, not only will we be dealing with Satan as, 
uh, say impersonating Christ, but we will also have to deal with the deception of demons personating angels from heaven. Now imagine how overwhelming this will be when you see these supernatural beings telling us that they are here in the name of heaven. It won't be enough as Seven Day Adventists to say, but look, his feet are not touching, uh, his feet are touching the ground. This will challenge everything that we believe in. This is why Jesus says, do not go and see for yourself. Great Controversy 624. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them. As, now this is talking about Satan. As Christ blessed the, his disciples when he was upon the earth, his voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious, heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people. And then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. We see this from Revelation chapter 16, 13 and 14. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So not only will Satan appear as Christ and angels coming from heaven, but he will also make it appear that your dead loved ones are being raised from the dead. This is why Ellen White calls this spiritualism. We have this false concept of when Satan comes and unleashes his spiritualism attack, it would be um, one here or one there. Uh, a, you know, maybe a few here or there. But no, remember... Um, the frogs of Egypt, and I want to go back to the frogs of Egypt. In Revelation 16, we were talking about the three unclean spirits like frogs. So why does the Bible use frogs? Now, the frogs should bring us back to Exodus in Mo the Moses, um, Moses and Egypt. In Exodus chapter 8, 3 and 4, we read, So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house, into your bedroom, on your bed, into the houses of the servants, on your people, in, into the ovens, and into your kneading bowls. And the frogs shall come up on you, on the people, on your people, and all your, on, on all your servants. So remember, every miracle that Moses did, the Egyptians were able to counterfeit it. When Moses brought the frogs onto the land, the Egyptians also brought the frogs into the land. This was the last miracle that they were able to counterfeit. So frogs represent the last counterfeit miracle of Satan. We see Satan coming as Christ. He will come with a multitude of angels. Many will be confronted by the spirits of devils personating beloved relatives or friends and declaring the most dangerous heresies. These visitants will appeal to our tenderest sympathies and will work miracles to sustain their pretensions. We must be prepared to withstand them with, with the Bible, with the Bible truth that the dead know not anything and they, and that they who thus appear are the spirits of devils. I don't know about you. I've had loved ones who passed away. And I know, I know most of you have, if, if not all. How much harder would it be in this time when we're seeing the false personation of Christ, but your loved one 
is right in front of you who passed away and saying, that is the Christ. Well, what are you doing? Your senses are going to be failing you. You're going to see. This is why we are told we need to have faith. Um, you know, blessed are those who, who believe without seeing. And, you know, Pastor brought up Downing Thomas because he, he needed to see to have faith. And that's why Jesus said, blessed are those who will, who will believe without seeing. It's going to be really hard if you're not in the word or know the word that say that that's not my loved one. They will look, talk, act just like that person, uh, how they looked, acted, and, and talked. How can you say, you know, why, why won't you worship him? He's the one that brought me out of the dead, just like he said he would. But I'll tell you something, just like, you know, Jesus says, when you hear, um, when you hear of, of the Messiah in the desert, don't go and look. We might be saying to ourselves, well, I know, I know that that's not the real Jesus, but let me see what he looks like. Let me see what's going on, because I won't be fooled. Yeah, you will. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. <laughs> yes. So this is something I think we need to understand. And before I really delved into this, studying this, I, I would always think not this way. But I want to tell you, the personating of Christ will not be just for a day and he is gone. Seeing as Christ, it will be short, but it's not going to be a day. <clears throat> Saying as Christ has come to set up his kingdom on earth. Thousands of his angels are walking among us. People that have died are now walking among us. The world has become the habitation of devils. They are no longer visiting. They, are now, they now live here. When Jacob <clears throat> went through his time of trouble... Jacob was not really concerned about his own life as much as his mental anguish. This is what Satan will be doing. He will try to get into the heads of God's people. He will try everything he can to make us doubt. Setting, seeing our dead loved ones walking among us will no doubt be overwhelming. If we are not held firm in the word of God, when the wind blows and the floods come, this house will fall. Revelation 13. We'll be, we'll be ending soon. Revelation 13, 4. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? This text is telling us that the world is worshiping Satan. And when the deadly wound of the papacy is healed, it will receive power. Now what kind of power will Satan give to his people? Miracle working power. Not only will the beast receive power from the dragon, but also the second beast, the United States, represented by the apostate Protestantism, he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. We see this in Revelation 13, 12. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Both beasts receive their power from the dragon. We will have demons personating angels, demons personating the resurrected dead. The wicked, those who accept the false Christ, are going to be able to heal people they will have miracle working power as evidence that the whole thing is of the Lord. And do we really think by saying his feet are not touching the ground is all we need to prepare for this. And most people think this way. And I'm not saying most people, some people, I'll say some people. I know people who grew up in the church they have a small foundation of it, but they left. And many of them will say, when I see the mark of the beast, when I see the Sunday law coming to pass, I know to come back. At that time, it is too late. 
Now is the time to prepare. Those are the ones that are going to betray us. Thank you. And you know, I, I always bring up the feet because that's what everyone says. Look, look at his feet. If his feet is touching the ground, that means it can't be Christ. But it's not as simple as that. When, we, when our senses are being overwhelmed by everything that's going on, all these miracles, and I always bring up this example, and I will always bring it up because it's, it's heartbreaking. I believe it would be a hospital like this or whatever, Satan, as Christ, will go to St. Jude Hospital and cure cancer from all those children. Yeah, but, Jesus isn't supposed to do that but if you are a mother, a grandmother with a child with cancer in St. Jude, and your child is now 100% cured, how can we as Adventists go to that mother and say, sorry, you know that person who healed your son, your daughter? That's not the real Christ. Don't believe in him. That mother be like, I don't care. He, my son and my daughter, my child is healed. Exactly. But, you know, and uh, I know, but then she's going to turn around and say, you're a heretic. You know, well, how, well, are you crazy? Are you, you know, this is why the world is going to go against us. I'm, you know, this, it will not be easy for us. If it was easy, you know, the Lord says it will not be easy. This is our last text from early writings, page 283. And this is at the very end when we are in our time of trouble. Soon I saw the saints suffering great mental anguish. They seemed to be surrounded by the wicked inhabitants of the earth. Every appearance was against them. Some began to fear that God had at last left them to perish by the hand of the wicked. But if their eyes could have been opened, they would have seen themselves surrounded by angels of God. Next came the multitude of the, ang of the angry wicked. And next, a mass of e evil angels hurrying on the wicked to slay the saints. But before they could approach God's people, the wicked must first pass this company of mighty holy angels. This was impossible. The angels of God were causing them to recede and also causing the evil angels who were pressing around them to fall back. This is what we'll be going through in our time of trouble, waiting for the second coming of Christ. And as, and I should have put it in, which I didn't, and as the multitude comes closer to us, that is when we look up into heaven and we see a cloud as big as of, of a half, the man, half of a man's fist coming closer. And that is our Redeemer drawing nigh. That, that'll be a glorious day. But until then, it's, if we are not worried, if we're not being prepared right now, prepared, as we were saying, country living, prepared in living through, in, uh, reading our gospel, our Bible, preparing our lives for the end times, we will not be ready. And we will be part of the multitude that goes against God's people. So let us pray that that doesn't happen. This upcoming year, we are challenging our members and visitors. Let's read the Bible. The whole Bible in one year. <laughs> so, so that is our challenge. Please, if you, um, and you know, I challenge everyone to read. But if you're driving, get it on Audible, get it on uh, wherever. And you can listen to it as you're driving also. You know, just listening and reading. Let's read the Bible.